Amen. Well, we're going to have prayer, and we're going to jump right in. Let's bow our heads. Our Father, we're so thankful for the wonderful privilege that you have given us fallen mortals to become acquainted with you and for giving us the hope of immortality. And this morning, we pray that you hide this preacher behind the cross, that you may flood this place with your spirit so that we can be led into truth and that we can see Jesus in a new and more powerful way. Thank you, Lord, for listening to our prayer, because we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. This morning, we don't have PowerPoint, but we have the Word, amen? That's all right. Romans chapter 9, we'll do a simple review for those of you who were not with us last Sabbath. Romans 9, we talked about the fact that in Romans 9, Paul is stressing the fact that God is sovereign. Because in Romans 9, the question that Paul is bringing to the table is like, wait a minute, if the Gentiles have the privilege of being adopted and being lavished with all of these spiritual blessings, what about the chosen people of God? What about Israel? So Paul is addressing that issue, and he's saying, hey, it's not that God's word has failed. It's not that God's promises are wishy-washy. It's just that not everybody that claims to be from Israel is actually from Israel, meaning that just because you are part of the institution of Israel doesn't de- obligate God to fulfill His promises to you if you're actually not even having faith in the very God that's promising this blessing. Does that make sense? And the spiritual truth is even alive today. Not everybody t- that claims to be a Seventh-day Adventist is actually a Seventh-day Adventist. Amen? Not everybody that claims to be a Christian is actually a Christian. Which means that Paul is saying that there are some, some of real Israel that are not part of physical Israel. That also must mean that there are Seventh-day Adventists that are not part of the institutional Seventh-day Adventist church that are out there somewhere. Now, you and I may be unaware of who they are, but God definitely is aware. Amen? Amen. So what that means then is that just because we're part of the institution doesn't necessarily mean that we're actually legit representatives of that institution. Does that make sense? So God is sovereign. God can bless whoever He wants. God has mercy on whoever He wants because He knows who are those that are the real Israel. And the idea is that all of us can be part of the real Israel if we have faith in Christ. Israel failed because they were trying to seek after their own righteousness in their own way. And they wanted to put God in a box, and they wanted to give God the terms and conditions of how He should operate. And that's always very complicated. When a religious institution tries to basically remove God of His Godship, and then the leadership of that religious institution tries to sit in the position of God. Very dangerous business. And one of the very things that we see in Bible prophecy is that there there would arise a religious power that would actually do this very thing. And those of you that have studied Daniel and Revelation know exactly what I'm referring to. But what we see here is that Israel was kind of having similar mannerisms. They were trying to control God, and they were trying to basically obligate God to do what they wanted Him to do. That is very dangerous because at the end of the day, God is God and we are not. Amen? And we have to celebrate that. Romans chapter 10, what... Paul is doing is he's developing this thought a little bit more, and he's trying to show what went wrong. And that's kind of what we're going to deal with here in Romans chapter 10. If you have your Bibles, go to Romans chapter 10. We're going to begin in verse 1. When you're there, please say amen. I'll be reading from the ESV, the English Standard Version. It says the following, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them. Who is the them? Israel. For Israel. Israel, that they might be saved. I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God. But what's the problem with their zeal? It is not according to the proper knowledge. For being ignorant of what? The righteousness that comes from God and seeking, this is the problem, seeking to establish their own righteousness, they did not do what? They did not submit to God's righteousness. Do you see the problem with Israel? 
Israel basically wanted to take God's plan and they wanted to edit it and tweak it according to their own terms. Does that sound familiar? Well, I wish we could say, man, this is so weird. We've never heard of that before. But we do this every single day with God. We go to the Lord, we take his blessings, and we kind of rewrite the conditions. <laughs> and we like to tone things down, right, to make it more conducive to us. And that's what happened to Israel. They failed. They were trying to pursue God's righteousness. The problem is that they were trying to do it based on their own merits. And this is the fundamental problem. I wish we could say this is old news, but it really isn't. This is current news in today's uh, Christian world. Verse 4. For Christ is the end of the law. Stop right there. See, this, this text gives us nightmares. Because a lot of people say, oh, you see, Christ is the end of the law. Boom. When you accept Jesus, you don't have to deal with the law anymore. Is that what Paul is saying? Let's, let's look at the text. For Christ is the end of the law. In what sense? For righteousness. To everyone who believes. And by the word, that word end there is the Greek word telos, T E L O S. And what that basically means is the word goal. The end, in, in, in to use a football analogy, the end zone, right? <laughs> He's the touchdown of the law. You understand that? He's the goal. In other words, how in the world can you try to seek after the law for righteousness and miss Christ? That's, that's Paul's point. It's like, you guys miss Christ's righteousness. You were all up in the law of God, but you, for whatever reason, didn't realize that the very goal of the law is Christ's righteousness. And then he continues, Paul continues, and he starts developing this two schools of thought, righteousness by the law versus righteousness by faith. And we're going to take, take it step by step here. Go to verse 5. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on what? Based on the law. That... The person who does the commandments shall live by them. Now, this is what we need to understand. There's nothing wrong with that understanding. In other words, Moses' understanding uh, as, as in, the, in the Mosaic uh, law was, hey, this is the law. Whoever keeps it shall live. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing innately wrong with that law. The problem... <laughs> is when humans get connected with that law because we've already broken the law. So guess what? The promise or the blessing of that law, we have, we're disqualified. We can't live by that law because we've already broken it. So there is no more negotiation. Does that make sense? The problem with Israel is that they looked at it. They're like, oh, yeah, we'll totally keep it. We got it. That's the problem. They didn't realize their utter helplessness and the fact that they couldn't depend on their own merits to keep this law because they've already broken it. So Paul now introduces another school of thought, praise the Lord. Otherwise, we would be really, really in problems. Verse 6, but the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of what? The word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, what's the outcome? You will be saved. Amen? Now, now I got to be sensitive here. But this is how you determine whether or not you have righteousness by works-ism. If you read that passage and you get uncomfortable, you really need to check yourself. Amen? Because if you read that passage and you're like, but wait a minute, it shouldn't be that easy. You know, you know what I'm talking about. Don't act like you don't know what I'm talking about. You read that passage and you're like, oh, but wait a minute, wait, it's not that easy. It requires more. If you, have these, if you have these symptoms, then you really need to check yourself. You really need to say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. I mean, the Bible says you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. 
For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between the Jew and the Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be what? He said it again. We have a problem with this text, right? Because we like, we're addicted to this whole concept of sanctification. Yeah? Now, is sanctification a bad or a good thing? It's a good thing. It's a biblical thing, right? Sanctification, being the process of, be, of being made holy. There's nothing wrong with sanctification. The problem with sanctification is when we start laying our eggs on sanctification and saying that sanctification is what saves us. Do you see that? That's the problem. When we start saying that sanctification is actually what saves us, then we're basically falling into the same problem that Israel dealt with. According to the text, it is very clear. Salvation comes by faith in what Christ has done. And Paul here is being somewhat sarcastic because he's basically saying that if you are depending on yourself, you're essentially bringing Christ down from the heavenly sanctuary, and you're basically bringing him up out of the grave. It's borderline irreverent, but really he's trying to show the danger with this whole idea of righteousness by works. And it's very crystal clear, ladies and gentlemen, that salvation comes not by us trying to accomplish the rule of the law because we've already been disqualified. We've already broken the law. We can't keep it. We can't. So we have to believe. And by the way, the word believe and faith, there is no difference. Believe or believing and faith is the same word, pistis, pisteo. It's the exact same word. So when it's talking about believing, it's talking about faith. It's not just saying intellectual, I agree. We're not talking about that. We're talking about belief, right? So the idea here is that in verse 14, now Paul begins developing a rationale and a philosophy of mission. Now, let let me let Paul do this because he does it way better than I can. Verse 14, listen to what he says. But how are they to call on him? Because the Bible just says that those that call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Paul says, well, how are they going to call on him in whom they have not believed, in whom they have not had any faith? And how are they to have faith in him of whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? You guys see that? So basically what Paul is saying is that if salvation depends purely on on an individual calling on the name of the Lord, believing in the merits of Christ. Paul is saying, well, wait a minute. If that's what saves us, how are they going to call if they don't believe? How are they going to believe if they have not heard? How are they going to hear if nobody preaches? And how are we going to preach if nobody is sent? I don't know if you see what Paul is doing here. He's basically saying that Israel was, they had the advantage because Israel was sent. Were they not sent? Who was Israel in the Old Testament? They were the chosen people of God. The chosen people of God to do what? To just kind of brag that their status is an elite status over all the pagans? Is that the idea? What was, what was, their, what was their role? to take the message and share it with the rest of the world, right? Now, I wasn't planning on going here, but man, it's just irresistible. Hold your finger to Ro- in Romans. Run with me to Deuteronomy. We're just going to we're going to take a little break. Let's take let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 7. This wasn't in my original plan, but let's talk a little bit about Israel and this whole idea of their role, their chosenness. They weren't chosen to brag. Amen. They weren't chosen to put any of the other nations down. Amen. They were chosen to be a light. They were chosen to be an example. They were chosen to get integrated and mix and share. Now, if you're Israel and if you're human, obviously the chosenness on the part of God can very, very much go to your head. Yes or no? We're the chosen people of God. (laughs) Obviously, we're better. I mean, look at us. We're the chosen people of God. God sees something special in us that he doesn't see in anybody else. So Deuteronomy chapter 7 is actually kind of a a reality check for Israel. It's kind of a newsflash. 
and it gives us, it tells us the reason why it was that God chose Israel. Deuteronomy chapter 7, and check out what verse 7 says, and when you're there, please say amen. Actually, let's start in verse 6. It says, chapter 7, verse 6, For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has what? Chosen you to be a people for what? For his treasured possession. I mean, listen to that language. Out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. Can you imagine that? You're like, wow, we were chosen out of all the people in the face of the earth. We must have it really going on. I mean, we must be super duper special. And then verse 7 comes and it brings that balloon down to the terra firma. Verse 7. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. Why did God choose Israel? For you were the fewest of all peoples. You can read the rest of the chapter when you get home. God here tells Israel, hey, Israel, I called you. Yes, it's a special calling. But I didn't call you because you had the most PhDs. Amen? I didn't call you because you were the most professional out of all the nations. I didn't call you because you had the fanciest architecture. He says, I called you because you were the most insignificant nation on earth. Now, why in the world would God, the most powerful being in the universe, call the most insignificant nation on earth to be his representatives. Why in the world would you do such a thing? Shouldn't you pick Egypt with his powerful army and his beautiful architecture? Why would you pick, pick the fewest? Why would you pick the least? Why would you pick the smallest in number? That seems a little bit contradictory and counterproductive, yes or no? Why did God do that? Because God wanted to protect the nation that he chose for taking all of the blessings and crediting all of those blessings and all of those advantages to their accomplishments, to their military prowess, to their intellectual capacities, and to their economic status. So he chose the one that was the fewest in number because they are forced to give God the credit. Because if they're the fewest, then they're like, well, there's obviously no way on earth that we could produce these blessings. So you have to, you have to conclude that this is not of man. <laughs> this is purely God. That's why he chose Israel. It's because they were the fewest. They were the most insignificant. And another reason why, which we don't have time to go to, is because Israel was positioned at the heart of ancient civilization. And there's a text for that in the book of Jeremiah. It says, I have put Jerusalem in the center. In other words, God chose Israel because God needed a strategic plan. He needed a small nation that wouldn't take all of this stuff to his head. Unfortunately, we know the, we know the rest of the story. And he needed a nation that was positioned in close proximity to the heavy, influential nations of the ancient civilization. You understand? Because he wanted to make sure that the message of salvation was reachable. You follow that? In other words, he did not, chose, he did not choose the kingdom of Antarctica. Why not? Well, because there's not a whole lot of people in Antarctica to start with, right? but because it would be counterproductive. Why would you choose a group of people that are 100% isolated from the rest of humanity? It doesn't make any sense. The idea is to choose representatives that will influence and that will rub shoulders with other human beings. Does that make sense? God chose Israel because they were the fewest. They were the smallest. And because they were right in the middle of the ancient civilized world. He wanted to make the message of truth salvation available to other people. Isn't God awesome? God is so brilliant. And by the way, the New Testament says God has chosen the foolish things of the world. <laughs> the Apostle Paul is consistent with the Old Testament to confound the wise. He has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the strong. Ladies and gentlemen, 
you are chosen by God. Amen? But be very careful what you do with that, ch that choice, with that election. Make sure that it doesn't go to your head at the expense of other people. And sadly, we have done a disservice. Can I be honest with you guys this morning? We have done a disservice because, and I want to go on record. I want to go on record. I believe that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is the remnant church of Bible prophecy. Amen? Are you comfortable with that? Okay. But what I don't believe is that we're all that in a bag of chips and all the denominations out there are losers. Amen? I don't believe that. And I think we've shot ourselves in the foot. We have discredited our ourselves, and we have basically helped other individuals to not find relevance in our message simply because we were too concerned about exalting our status at the expense of others. And let's be clear, Romans 9. <laughs> but we're the remnant. Whoa! Romans 9, God is sovereign. Just because you claim to be part of the remnant doesn't mean that you're part of the remnant. Amen? Because God is looking for the true worshipers, those that had faith in Him. Amen? So just because you're part of an institution that may or may not have legitimate status of special, a special calling, that doesn't necessarily mean that just because you claim to be a part of that group that automatically you're a part of that group. Also, using Paul's logic, if, it's, if true Israel is in the Gentile world, because I think that's what he's saying in Romans chapter 9, not all of Israel are actually of Israel. That means that there's a lot of Gentiles that are actually Israel at heart. That would go to say that there are Seventh-day Adventists that are not in the Seventh-day Adventist church. Amen? That in God's perfect timing, he will bring them accordingly. Are you comfortable with that? There are millions of people, quote-unquote, out there that are not part of the institutional identity of the Seventh-day Adventist church, and they're more Adventists than we are. And by the way, there's spirit of prophecy to back that up, by the way, if you were concerned. There's spirit of prophecy. If you read the Great Controversy, it is crystal clear that there are millions of people that are more faithful to the little light that they have than we are to the to the beams of light that we have. Why am I saying all of this? Because all of this helps us to stay humble. <laughs> it keeps us grounded. It's not about me. It's not about the institution. It's about God, and it's about the message. But we get so caught up with the institution that we clip our wings and we burn our bridges of influence, and then we find ourselves flirting with extinction. We find ourselves flirting with extinction because now... Everyone understands, oh, those individuals, yeah, they're a little bit kind of, you know, they think they're all that. And this, is the pro this is the problem with Romans. So Romans 10, Paul here is saying, whoa, I want Israel to be saved. I'm not throwing Israel under the bus. I'm just saying that all of Israel is not of Israel. Israel was trying to put God in a box. They were trying to get God's righteousness on their own terms. And then listen to what verse 19 says. Excuse me, verse 18. But I ask, have they not heard? <laughs> Indeed they have, for their voice has gone out to all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In other words, he's saying, wait a minute. Didn't Israel know? Yes, they knew. They knew. They had the oracles of God. They had the truth. They had the law. They had the sanctuary. They had the ceremonial law, and they still failed. They still failed. So in, in, in the end of chapter 10, he's showing, and he uses Bible text. Paul, Paul's giving like a pretty powerful theological explanation here. He's showing that God in the Old Testament promised that he was going to bring the Gentiles into the spiritual commonwealth of Israel. And he starts describing why that is. And in verse 20 of chapter 10, he says, Then Isaiah is so bold as to say, I have been found by those who did not seek me. I have shown myself to those who did not ask for me. Who is he referring to? He's referring to the Gentiles. And then what does, how does he describe Israel? Verse 21, last verse in chapter 10. But of Israel, he says, 
all day long. I have held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary to people. Ladies and gentlemen, God was with Israel from day one. And all day long, he stretched out his hands. He was trying to win them over. And unfortunately, Israel, we know the story. Just read the Old Testament. They got corrupted. Everything went to their head. And then they started adopting pagan ideas and pagan principles to the point where they started practicing child sacrifice. God was all day long holding out his hands to a disobedient and contrary people. Now, before you start throwing stones at Israel, look at yourself in the mirror. Amen? If you're brutally honest with yourself, you're like, man, I don't know why God is so patient with me. I should have been disqualified years ago. And that's the point, is that God chooses who he wants to be merciful to. God is sovereign. It's not about who who is part of the institutional this or institutional that. It's about the heart. Chapter 11, he now starts talking about a switcheroo that occurs. And the switcheroo is that the Israelites are basically hardened, and now the Gentiles are brought in. And Paul, in a very elaborate manner, starts showing that the Gentiles being brought in produces jealousy in the hearts of the Israelites. They're like, what? To the point where Israel now, because of their jealousy, some come back to God, and they say, we want this back. I would like to have this again. By the way, this happens in our day and age. Let me paint a a clear picture in the couple minutes that I have left here. In many churches, many denominations, you have people that have been in the church for years, for decades, and praise God for those individuals. Amen? Praise the Lord. I don't think we give people enough credit who've been, who've been holding up the, the, the faith for long periods of time. I think we need to show more love to those type of people. However, there are individuals that have been in church for decades and decades and decades, and it seems like they're, they're still at the spiritual level than when they first got here. Can, can, we, can we speak openly? And then what you have is you have brand new individuals that come in, right, whether it's a Bible study or a net series, whatever, through whatever avenue, and you have new people that are just on fire. You met these people? Brand new. They just quit their jobs because they're trying to be faithful to God. Amen? They're trying to basically get their life in order because they have this conviction that Jesus is coming soon, and they want to be part of the last day individuals that share the three angels' message. I mean, that's exciting stuff. But you have these individuals come in, and what happens? Let's be honest. What happens? You got a new wave of just inspired and passionate people, newly converted Gentiles, right? And what do the old Israelites do? Whoa, gang. (laughs) Tone it down just a couple notches, right? They need to tone you up. Amen? And we want people, no, you need to stay down because I am, I've been here forever, and you're all of a sudden exceeding my spirituality. Well, then maybe you need to be humble and ask the Lord to get you up to speed. Amen? Do you see that? So even though we're talking about ancient stuff, Israelites and Gentiles, we're, we're living this every single day in our modern American church culture. We got people coming in here on fire. And a lot of times they're like, whoa, Did, do they believe what, you, what I just learned? It doesn't seem like they believe. And I'm not trying to knock or just throw or be disrespectful. I'm just simply diagnosing a reality. And the reality is that many times newer individuals come here, they're passionate, and it produces jealousy in the old Israelites. Now, in a good setting, the older Israelites at, at first will feel some level of jealousy, and then they'll find their first love experience as well. Amen? And that's the idea, is keeping each other accountable and in check. That's what Paul's addressing here in Romans 11. Now, in Romans 11, if you come with me to Romans 11, beginning in verses 1 onward, as we bring this to a close, Romans 11, verses 1, I ask then, has God rejected his people? His people being Israel. By no means. 
I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God hasn't rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he appeals to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets. They have demolished your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what is God's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men in Israel who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. But if it is by grace, (laughs) it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. I mean, Paul is just, he's an Einstein. Paul is a spiritual Einstein. What he's doing is he's showing you that in the Old Testament, even when the prophets wanted to reject Israel, because by the way, the prophets... Israel gave the prophets a headache. Oh, my goodness. I mean, they prophesied, and many of these prophets were basically martyred. They were killed by Israel themselves. And Elijah's like, God, you wanted me to prophesy to these people? These people are out to lunch. I'm the only one. And God, in his compassion and his mercy and his tact, sensitivity and grace, he says, my child, you are not alone. There's 7,000 other Israelites that you don't have a clue of who are being faithful to me. What Paul is basically saying here that Israel, God is, wants to save Israel even when the church, even when the leadership wants to throw Israel under the bus. So he's using an Old Testament experience to show them that. And later on in, in, in chapter 11, what he's showing is that Israel's failure led to the Gentile spiritual success. And then he says something brilliant. He says, if Israel's failure led to the Gentiles' acceptance, how much more of a blessing would Israel's repentance be? You see that? If Israel's rejection led to the Gentiles being accepted, how much more of a blessing will it be when Israel repents? Now, the interesting thing is that later on, (laughs) Paul here shifts gears and he actually has choice words for the gentiles because he's saying listen gentiles you've been chosen the the israelites are jealous and maybe through that jealousy they can repent and come back to faith and then he says and and we'll read it together verse 16 as we bring this to a close verse 16 it says if the dough offered as first fruits is holy so is the whole lump and if the root is holy so are the branches But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you you are, remember, it is not you who support the roots, but the root that supports you. And I could go on, but I won't for the sake of time. What Paul basically is saying here is, Gentiles, be very careful that you don't repeat the same mistake that Israel repeated. By the Gentiles being accepted, you can easily, as a Gentile, be like, yeah, that's right. We're the new kids on the block. Move over, old Israelites. Paul's like, whoa, don't be proud and let it get to your head because you're repeating the same mistake that they did. So he's saying, never forget that it is because of their failure that you were brought in. So he's basically keeping them in check and saying, whoa, you got to bring it down a couple notches. And what he's trying to show is that Gentiles and Israelites can coexist by faith. Amen? Liberals and conservatives can coexist by faith. Amen? Democrats and Republicans. Whoa, I'm losing my mind, right? Amen? Democrats and Republicans can coexist. Amen? If you got faith in Christ. Because if you have faith in Christ, all that stuff is minor. That's just like sideline marginal issues. Amen? Amen? But if you don't have faith in Christ, then no, you can't coexist because all of that is the pillar that's on the, the nucleus, and you're never going to see eye to eye when you're deifying your particular persuasions, whether it's political or what have you. So the idea here is that the Gentiles and the Israelites can coexist. Gentiles, do not let your acceptance get to your head and don't look down on Israel. And that's, a, that's a, a warning to all of us. And in closing, if you jump down to verse 26, 
In this way, all Israel will be saved, as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob, and this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As regards the gospel, they are enemies of God for your sake. But as, as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable, just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience. So they too have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also may now receive mercy. For God has consigned everyone to disobedience so he could punish them. Is that what it says? That he may have mercy on all. And then this is when Paul just loses it. Paul just loses it. He's writing it, and he just goes crazy. He says, oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Paul just goes, he just loses it. He just throws his pen down. He's like, I can't believe it. This is so amazing. Romans chapter 11 is a warning for all of God's people in the last days who struggle with, the, with elite, elite syndrome, who think that they're all that in a bag of chips because they've been chosen of God. Gentiles and Israelites can go exist together. Different races can coexist together. Different ages can coexist together. And whatever other, however, whatever other category of the caste system you want to involve, when Christ is present, when faith is present, it removes all of those unnecessary barriers. The question is, what type of mindset do you have? Are you an Israelite? Are you hating on the Gentiles, the new guys? Or are you a Gentile? who think you're all that in a bag of chips because you've, you're new and you got passion. Are you throwing the Israelites under the bus? Whoa. So this is an admonition to both Israelites and Gentiles. Do not let it go to your head. Because once it goes to your head, you've lost it. And once you've lost the balance, everything that you do will be a stumbling block and it will be counterproductive for the cause of God. How many of you today are sick and tired of living in a, in, a, in a kind of an us and them spiritual environment. And today, you just want to throw in the towel. You want to throw your jersey down. Amen? Your jersey, your helmet, and your shoulder pads. And you want to say, you know what? I'm done. I want to represent Christ. I want to present Christ and Christ alone. I may have my own opinions, and that's okay. But I can still love somebody, coexist with somebody else, even though they have different opinions. But I want to be of Christ. I want to be a part of the solution. And I don't want to keep throwing hot air into the problem. Amen? If this is you, I invite you to raise your hand and say, Lord, I realize that I'm the problem. Whether you're an Israelite or a Gentile, I'm the problem. And today, Lord, I surrender, and I want you to help me love my fellow Gentiles and love my fellow Israelites. And if you want to take this even one step further, I invite you to stand as we sing hymn number 334, Come Thou Founts of Every Blessing. Come Thou Fount of
Father, this morning we pray that you may take our hearts, that you may seal them in your courts above. Father, we're prone to wander, and we feel it. We're prone to leave the God that we love. This morning, O oh Lord, we recognize that we have been haughty and arrogant. We recognize, O oh Lord, that our chosenness has gone to our head. And we've realized, Lord, that we've been a bad influence on those that were sincerely looking to have a relationship with you. Amen. And Father, we do not want to continue living in this way. We repent. We ask you to forgive us. We ask of you, Lord, to remind us that we were the fewest, that we were the smallest, that we were the weakest, and that you've called us not because we're high and mighty, but you called us, O oh Lord, because you're high and mighty. And because we are utterly in desperate need to be constantly under your watch care. Amen. I pray for my on-fire Gentiles in this church. New faith may not be as well informed of history and the trajectory of, of the church. May be discouraged, a little confused. I pray, O oh Lord, that you may protect that individual group of people who at times may feel tempted to throw in the towel. I pray, Lord, for the Israelites in the church, those that have been, been walking with you for years and years and years but have a struggle of their own. I pray, O oh Lord, that you give humility to both parties, that you help us all, Lord, to recognize that it's not about us and them, that we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers. Mm -hmm. Help us realize, Lord, who the real enemy is. The real enemy is Satan. Help us realize that we have no chance of fighting Satan without you. Hmm. And help us realize, O oh Lord, that we're doing the work of Satan when we are deifying and exalting ourselves at the expense of other people. Help us, O oh Lord, to be about our Father's business. Help us, O oh Lord, to be selfless. Help us, O oh Lord, to think of others better than, than ourselves. Mm -hmm. And help us, O oh Lord, to coexist. Because only then can we be ready for translation. Because if we cannot coexist down here on earth, Lord, there's no way we're going to be able to coexist in mm -hmm. the new earth. Thank you, O oh Lord, for listening to our prayer. I pray that you help us, O oh Lord, to start today the work of repentance, mm -hmm. the work of humility, the work of saying, I'm sorry, I was wrong. The work of saying, you know what? You're not as bad as I thought you were. I was wrong about you. I said certain things about you that were wrong. Help us, O oh Lord, to reconcile Israelites and Gentiles together and be able to work together for the real reason why we're here, and that is to bring the gospel to those that have not heard so that they can call on you and so that they can experience salvation. Thank you, O oh Lord, for your mercy. Thank you that all day long you stretch your hands to a wayward people like us. Amen. And my, our prayer, O oh Lord, is that you keep on hunting us, keep on coming behind us, Lord, and keep at us and don't throw in the towel because we need you to constantly be after us. And help us, O Lord, to turn around and to yield and to recognize that you're not out hunting us because you want to take us out, but because you want to restore us. You want to bring us back to where we were. Thank you, Lord, for listening to this prayer. 
Be with us all, Lord, as we worship you in the subsequent hours of, our, of the Sabbath that is remaining. And continue, Lord, to minister to us as we minister to others. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Let everyone say. Amen. Amen. Amen.